You know, once upon a time, the only videos I made were about chapter leaks because I was really just trying to attract content desperate wolves. It was the sort of thing where I really could have just posted a link and made that the video. I recall talking about how little I knew about Stranger Things, and that was really just me vomiting words and editing onto a screen. A lot has happened between now and then, but maybe nothing has because I still haven't bothered to finish the fucking show. The Demogorgon seems like one of the least cool things about this game now that I can play as fucking Pyramid Head, but maybe that's just perception. After all of these new chapters and all of the new information, my brain doesn't get the same dopamine hits it used to. I guess the girls in my life probably noticed that about me too. Hey, sorry, was this getting weird? Let me find a meme real fast. Anyway, the point I was making is that once you get the general idea of how the devs code a killer, you'll find that nothing can ever live up to your imagination. I mean, this killer in the show comes from a separate universe and drags its victims inside so that it can fucking eat them. A lot of people were hoping this manifested as survivors towing the line between realities and <laughs> no. How's this killer work then? Well, you should know you voted for him, but I'll meet you halfway. The Demogorgon is a map presence killer that uses portals to bridge two points on the map, and then he gets a short range lunge attack that works 12% of the time. Portals can be placed anywhere as long as anywhere is bigger than Ben Shapiro's head and about as smooth too. Once you've placed this portal, it's invisible and survivors can't touch it. You can open six of these at base and then use a few add-ons to make more. After you have two placed, you can tunnel through the fabric of reality itself and come out clean on the other end. Using this activates the portal, meaning you can now see them on the ground and survivors can too. Not only that, but if a survivor walks up to it, they can actually knock down your Lego set. The only saving grace is that you can actually cancel this by teleporting through something they're trying to break. You ever watch Game Maker's Toolkit? There's this really fascinating episode where they break down how some of the best mechanics in video games have two uses that are tied to a single button press. Like how Mario's jump both heightens the character and crushes the enemies he lands on. So Behavior, in all of their wisdom, was like, oh, that doesn't sound too hard. Why don't we have our power do like eight things? Not only do the portals allow you to teleport to them, they also make survivors oblivious when they stand on them. Not only do they make survivors oblivious when they stand on them, they also get revealed to you when you press the charge button. Not only do they get revealed to you when you press the charge button, they also hide your heartbeat when you emerge from them. Not fucking only do they hide your heartbeat when you emerge from them, but you can also add more debuffs through add-ons. I did just fly through all those little details, but the difference is between that and Mario's jump is that the boot crunch special always works the same way when you use it. It's just that the goal you're trying to achieve changes. With this, it's more of an attribution of convenience. The uses of these portals are so numerous, but I'm gonna break this down into something very simple right here and right now. The only things you should focus on are map traversal and game slow down. Everything else is just sort of nice when it happens. For placing these, you'll almost exclusively want to put them on generators and exit gates, with a few niche spots that are so rare I can't think of them. This means that you can either travel to that generator instantly to break it, or you can force survivors to rip it apart before going back to their business. On occasion, I will put a portal near a hook, but that's mostly because I want to use that portal for instant travel and couldn't give a shit if it gets wrecked when I leave it. Back to the gens, though, there are two ways to place these. You either put it essentially right on top of the generator to get map information information and time-wasting bullshit, or you place the portal slightly out of view so that you can jump anyone that doesn't see you coming. Which would be a lot stronger if it wasn't for the fact that the Demogorgon is a theater major and must loudly announce that he is using a portal so that everyone can get six feet of distance. This isn't just for his portal use, but also for his attacks, by the way. Because letting all of the survivors know that you're missing your swings was such an immersive feature that they couldn't contain it to just survive with friends. Then there's the other part of his kit. If you hold down the power button, you, quote, channel the abyss. This lets you see the locations of survivors that are near your portals, and you begin winding up your shred attack. This does come at the cost of some speed, but only a smooth-brained person would actually walk around with this in the first place. You only need a few seconds to hear the heartbeat of the killer instinct, and when using the shred in a chase, you want to give survivors as little time to react as possible. Wait, what's that? You don't know what shred is? God, for an interconnecting segue, you sure are fucking stupid. The shred attack is triggered by pressing the attack button while channeling the abyss. That might sound badass, but it really means you just move forward very, very fast. And then it turns out you can only go straight forward when you use it and the ability goes straight in the fucking dumpster. I'm getting flashbacks to the bind I found myself in when I said that the pig's dash was kind of ass, but I don't make these so that I can agree with other people, so excuse me while I build this brick wall. The lunge attack lets the Demogorgon jump forward and deal damage. The longer you channel the abyss, the farther the attack goes. But in open spaces, or not open spaces, the obvious telegraphing makes it very easy for survivors to move out of the way. Here's the thing, you have no control over this once you start the dash and there's a whiff recovery because there always has to be one of those. I know some of you get to use this and 
and land hits, and I'm not saying it's impossible, but you need to do so when you're 100% sure they have nowhere to go. Thankfully, if you charge into a pallet, you break it. Side note, he didn't always do this. There used to be a red add-on that you needed until it turned out that it was such a niche and useless upgrade that it might as well be part of his kit. Anyway, where was I? Oh, Montresor, another brick, how kind. In my opinion, it's way better to use this to ward away obvious moves by survivors. If you see that they're going to go through a doorway, you can charge up, leading most intelligent people to go, oh, he's about to come over here, and then they don't go that way. The mind games are too real! By the way, don't misconstrue my dislike for apathy. Even if I think the move will hurt my chances more than it helps, I always like to keep it in the back of my head and try to think of opportunities to use it because I'm not some boomer set in his ways. The Demogorgon also comes with three perks to include in your build, in the hopes of making you rethink every single killer with the possible. Oh, what's that? You're just gonna use barbecue? Well, I'd be shocked if it wasn't for the fact that you ordered barbecue every fucking time we came here, but in your defense, whenever they update the menu, they just add more salt. Surge causes generators within 32 meters to instantly damage themselves when you down a survivor. This isn't that bad, to be honest. Don't worry, they only get worse, but sadly for my precious flow, Surge is just okay. It can add a level of convenience in certain situations and be used to suss out nearby survivors if they're on a generator. But I'm just saying, Infectious Fright exists and looks way sexier. The gen damage is decent, especially if you're on a map like the game, where you can damage a gen that you can't reach. Unfortunately, perks can't be map reliant because Dead by Daylight has a random map pool. Sure, you can bring offerings to change that, but when you have a perk that only works in a specific instance that you have to rig in the first place, you might as well not. I think this game already lives in the scourge of meme builds, meaning that all creativity is considered a wacky break from the intense and laborious set of perks that we feel tied down to. So in the interest of being a freedom fighter, I'm gonna try really fucking hard to give you an excuse to use Surge. While it does exclude some really good perks like Pop Goes the the weasel, sit, I'm not done. You could break multiple generators with this and the 30 second cooldown is really short. Really, that time is just to prevent it from stacking over and over again. Though maybe you could use it like the opposite of Infectious Fright, meaning that you can look at the fact that it's not triggering, immediately exclude all of the current generators from your investigation, and be on your way. That's it. That's the best I got. Take it or leave it. Mindbreaker is bad. I'm glad because now we're back on track. Mindbreaker causes survivors to become exhausted for three seconds when they interact with a generator that has less than 50% of its progress. Bad on its own, but the key here is that it also causes exhaustion recovery while active. One of the very few ways that survivors will slow themselves down in this game is through exhaustion. Exhaustion is basically a cooldown for all of the stronger abilities that survivors have. If they use Sprint Burst to Lightning McQueen to an objective, they will have to wait 40 seconds before they can do that again. That timer normally only pauses when they're running. So during every other interaction, that survivor will start regaining their sprint. What most people tend to do is run everywhere, then sweat off that refractory period by hunching themselves over a generator. Mindbreaker can somewhat effectively curve that and turn it into full-blown ED. That said, I think this perk needs to be run with Blood Echoes as its sister perk, because 90% of the time a survivor will be using an ability that exhausts them during a chase, and unless you plan on watching them drift into the sunset, you're gonna try and hook them. The problem? Being hook resets your exhaustion meter back to zero. I guess the entity spray Lysol on them or something. Blood Echoes inflicts exhaustion on injured survivors when you hook one of their friends, allowing you to passively dull out this debuff and make sure it takes up people's attention. So why did I say it's bad if I actually defend it? One, because if I loved everything you would get fucking bored, and two, it is fucking bad. One of the worst things about Mindbreaker is that the interaction with it is survivor-sided only. You could win a game thanks to this perk, but how the fuck would you know that? There's literally nothing to indicate that this perk is doing its job. It's not like it tells you if someone is exhausted or not, it just makes them that. Finally, we have Cruel Limits. Cruel Limits is the worst. I would describe the perk to you, but I have a second proposition. Go watch this video I made and go to this timestamp. As they say, anyone can cook. Since this video is a bit longer than normal, I'm sure at some point your eyes have gazed over to the bottom right and you've likely said, what the fuck is that? Okay, we'll call this a recommended perk section, even though I know most of it is just rabid theorization and some jerking off. That in mind, allow me to segue with a perk that you are already planning on running. Pop Goes the Weasel activates when you hook a survivor, and if you break a generator while this is active, it goes down by 25% instantly. With your overbearing map presence, you can pop up right there and do the thing instantly. It's really not any more complicated than that. It's good because it's powerful, and it's better because you make it stronger. One of the weaknesses Demogorgon has comes in the fact that he's so fluid on the map that survivors will tend to jump on a gen the moment you walk away because of the cooldown between his warps. For debatably even less sophisticated reasons is Corrupt Intervention. This perk blocks the three farthest generators for two whole minutes at the start of the match. Though, weirdly enough, I've noticed survivors tend to spawn right next to these generators, so maybe they're just lying to me. 
The purpose here is to take advantage of those two minutes to set up enough portals that you'll need later on. If you see a survivor, I would be hesitant to chase them. Heal them out. If they're going to run you around for two minutes, fuck them, not worth it. But when survivors are dumb, they're dumb. So if you think they can't loop, go for it. The running thing you might see on this list is that the Demogorgon can be anywhere at any time. Most survivors tend to have a very small imaginary idea of where you are. Like how guards and Metal Gear keep track of your last known location, but with the Demogorgon you can instantly relocate almost all of the time. And these perks play into that unpredictability. That's why I've been tiptoeing around the perks Furtive Chase and Nemesis. These perks are a direct combination set. Nemesis triggers every time someone swaps obsession status, while also adding more things that can make you the obsession. These are things like getting stunned or blinded, which oddly works really well with the shred ability in a poetically humorous way. When it triggers, that survivor is oblivious for a whole minute. Normally, this isn't all that great because of the aforementioned caution status, but since you're literally swimming all over the map and hiding your presence, you can actually come up on angles people don't expect. When the obsession is hooked, someone unhooks the obsession, they become the obsession. And now I've said obsession so much that the word feels weird in my mouth. As far as you're concerned, the perk does nothing else, because it might as well. I might possibly replace this with Dragon's Grip when it comes out. I don't know who the fuck is here that doesn't keep up with the state of the game, but Dragon's Grip is going to be added in next week, and it sounds pretty nice here. After kicking a generator for the next 30 seconds, the first survivor that interacts with it will scream, revealing their location for 4 seconds and becoming afflicted with the exposed status effect for 60 seconds. Combine that with your ability to simply appear at a generator and you might have something meta changing. Plus, like I said earlier, survivors will jump on a generator the second they feel safe, allowing you to work past that minimal 30 second timer. I won't recommend anything more than just trying it because I myself don't know how well it'll hold up in practice, but my chalkboard says yes so far. I'm also tepidly curious about using certain far range aura reading perks. Despite territorial imperative being about as useful as dried cum, I think you could take advantage of it here, but just because you can work around the pesky things like the distance requirement it doesn't mean that the perk is good since people almost never go in the basement. Okay, fine, don't use that. Let's talk about surveillance then, because if you combine this with Surge, you can have really decent map knowledge and you can find out which generators to teleport to. There, that's your meta build. As for add-ons, they're better designed than most, but that's not saying much. His brown upgrades are sufficient because they can cover up things that high-tier add-ons can't, like adding a new portal or letting you drop them on the ground faster. I wouldn't suggest taking the add-ons that let you recover faster from Shred, since missing them isn't something I would consider part of his kit. Personally, I enjoy the ones that introduce more durability to the portals, because I like the thought of someone waiting very, very patiently to sift through something they would rather not feel like doing. Plus, if you apply the right kind of pressure, ripping up a portal isn't a choice, it's a mandate. There's also debuffs that linger on portals, which can pretty much always trigger, but on the other hand, I wouldn't speak highly of their usefulness in the first place. I wouldn't say that there's a best combination of add-ons since they float around the same fine line, but my go-to is a slowdown on the portal destruction speed and another attached to the undetectable duration. There's a red add-on that basically gives you 5 whole seconds of no terror radius when leaving a portal, which is nice because as it stands, the current duration is fucking garbage. You can double stack these if you're insane, but if you do, make sure you place your portals a space away from the generator you're trying to monitor. It's kind of cool because they were so close to ditching the two bad red add-ons, but nope, we still have this one. See the auras of injured survivors while traversing the upside down. Okay, so why? This is a condition on top of a condition. Not only does the survivor have to be injured, but since I can't actively look around while using my power, I must also be luckily facing them to get the location. I guess I could just tunnel every person that gets off the hook, since I know both which direction they're facing and probably have a quicker way there, but only if the devs insist. The last thing you could do in theory is use both of the portal add-ons. If you do the math, there are 8 generators in a match and 6 portals at your disposal. Meaning, if you use both of these, you'll have a portal for a generator. The reason I'm opposed here is because you'll spend all of your time monitoring the portals instead of actually chasing people. Here's one small tip for the road though. If you want to be a piece of shit, when you walk up to a generator, place a portal right there. Then walk slightly out of the line of sight and place a second portal. Then leave through the first one. This will activate the portal and they'll think it's important, but you can jump from behind with the stupid portal. And no one will ever expect this because it's so fucking dumb that you'd need a brain scraper stuck in your nose to want to waste that many resources. This fucking works in some situations though, and you'll be pretty much safe because when they break that first portal and hear the sound of you teleporting, they won't imagine it'd be back to their location. Okay, are we out of tips? Yeah, you weren't going to use them anyway. I don't know if I have what you can call a long time fan, but many people might remember just how much I used to shit on this character character, and I still hold up on some of that whining. Despite the potential hidden between something that came from a different fucking dimension, the devs reduce it down to something that growls and jumps, but I...
Fine, I softened up a little bit while playing him to get footage. Or maybe it's the eight pages of single space size 12 font that I'm looking at. Plus, I saw this guy get Morried and it really brightened my day. Yeah. P.S. He was a really nice guy when I spoke to him and you should check him out. Granted, maybe it's unfair of me to whine and complain about his power being so tame when I couldn't even be bothered to watch all the episodes. Maybe in season 7 he fires lasers out of his mouth and I could have complained about that instead. Although it seems like you can hit a Demogorgon with a bat and deal just enough damage, which is the opposite of what I want. So if I sit in ignorance land, I could just pretend that Steve Harrington isn't capable of 180ing and decking me in the jaw. Though, let's be real again and say that the Legion has no right to try and swing at David King, who could probably garnish his drink with their teeth if he wanted to. Or maybe we could look at how the Blight is just a scrawny dude with a cane and an amphetamine addiction. Yeah, okay, I'll save that shit talking for next week. <laughs>